I want to start with a story. 1965, 55 years ago, I was sitting in my apartment in Germany and the phone rings. Pick it up and it and the uh, uh, operator says, you have a collect call from Zagreb, Yugoslavia. Will you accept the charges? And I said, I have no idea where Zagreb is. I don't know anybody there. And then a voice came on and it was a friend of mine who had been in Greece and he had had an accident and he escaped through Yugoslavia, got as far as Zagreb and called us up, wanted us to put him up while he got his car fixed. So that was my first exposure to Yugoslavia. Now, what I want to do tonight is make a little bit of sense out of the mess in the Balkans in 1990s. I'm not going to say I'm going to make a lot of sense out of it, but I'll make some sense out of it. I want to give you a history lesson of the Balkan area. And in particular, talk about some of the more salient features of the century in the Balkans, and there were a lot. It was a very, very active place. Then I want to discuss the Balkan fighting during the 1990s. I'm not going to talk very much about the fighting other than some of the more significant battles in the conflict. And then finally, what I want to do is consider this mess with what followed in the Middle East, because this actually happened before the Arab Spring. But the same things that generated the Arab Spring generated what was going on there. Linda, I can't do that. Here are the key players in those wars. The first one was Bosnia, and part of Bosnia was something called the Republika Skripska, Croatia, Kosovo, Montenegro, and Serbia. And Serbia was known as the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia as all of this was going on. If you look at their different religions, they were different. Some of them were Islamic, some of them were Christian, some of them were Serbian Orthodox, and some were mixes of all of the above. Ethnically speaking, speaking there were, if you look at Bosnia, three different ethnicities in Bosnia. The other countries with multi-ethnic were Serbia with lots of minorities. Prior to the First World War, half of them were in Austria-Hungary and half of them were in the Ottoman Empire. After the war, they were all in Yugoslavia. During World War II, they were all occupied by Nazi Germany. So I want to talk about these four countries, really. The other two are just offshoots. Here's the rest of the Balkans. And if you look at them, they were fairly similar to the first group. Different religions, although most of them were Eastern Orthodox. But most of them were in Nazi Germany. In fact, Bulgaria and, and Romania were part of the Nazi uh, pact. These countries were all neutral during the Balkan War. Now, I want to give you a quick analysis of what those spreadsheets, that's where I started. I was trying to make sense out of this country that you see on the right. And so those spreadsheets were where I started. All of the key players were provinces of Yugoslavia. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia was established in 1918 at the Paris Peace Conference. It was not established by the conference. It was established by groups of people from within these provinces who wanted a united country, and the Peace Conference just validated it. They had all been part of either the Ottoman Empire or the Austria-Hungarian Empire. They'd all been occupied by the Nazi Germans. Sort of. Now, several countries that 
were occupied by the Nazis and part of the Ottoman Empire didn't get into the Balkan Wars, I'm not even going to try to figure out why not, because I'm going to focus on the ones who did. Primary distinction between the Balkans who were fighting appeared to be two things. One was religion, as, as Norman said, and the other is tribal heritage. These people are incredibly tribal. Less than 20 million people, all Southern Slavs, would not find ways to live in harmony as Yugoslavia, and I'm talking now the Yugoslavia of Tito, and I'm gonna talk some about Tito, disintegrated. This is what I sent out, and, and these are the four miscreants, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, and this Republika Skripska, which is actually a rebellion within Bosnia. It formed a, a separate country and stayed a separate country for about 15 years. It is now back to being part of Bosnia, as I understand it. I'm going to talk about the various numbers that you see up there. Those are sequential. Those are the things that happened that I thought were worthy of, of some discussion. Now, these are the four countries we're talking about where most of the military activities occurred. Serbia, which was Yugoslavia, had the Yugoslavian army. It had a fairly sized, fairly good sized regular army and a lot of trained reservists. It had multiple aviation, armored, and artillery units. Croatia was mostly what they called reservist brigades. They had some tanks and they had four regular unit brigades. I couldn't find out how big how many troops were actually in those. It was called the Croatian Defense Council. Bosnia had a home guard of 85,000 men and it had 2,000 territorial detachments. Think of ter territorial detachments as a home guard. Now the Republic itself, which broke off from Bosnia, had 80,000 regulars from the Yugoslav People's Army. And it all, they all had tanks and they all had artillery. So these, it was like the Hatfields and the McCoys in a, in a sense, except they were heavily armed. Now here's the overview. Initially, communist Yugoslavia had six republics. There were three main belligerents in the Balkan War, Serbia, Bosnia, and Croatia, except that Croatia had a civil war and this Republica was formed and it became part of the conflagration. Now here's the first major difference. <clears throat> Two of the republics, Slovenia and Croatia, wanted to decentralize. But the biggest republic, Serbia, wanted to expand centralized control and they had control of the army. So part of the issue was, do we stay a single country or do we break up into what has now been called balkanizing? Do we break up into separate entities? In June of 1991, Slovenia and Croatia declared independence. Immediately, the Yugoslav army marched into Croatia and into Slovenia. Almost immediately, Bosnia declared independence that same year. So three of the countries broke away from what was Yugoslavia. In Bosnia, the Muslims and the Croats organized an independence referendum, and they founded the Republic of Skripska. These four groups and various others fought for three years and, and they really fought for who's going to be in charge of me. NATO intervened in 1995 primarily against Serbia, interestingly. 
The war concluded with the agreement for peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1995, known as the Dayton Agreement. That's the overview. Okay, I want to do a, a, a divergent that that uh, Jerry has encouraged me to do. I want to talk a little bit about ethnicity. Here are the two primary ethnic groups, Croatian and Serbians. A lot of difference, right? <clears throat> Yugoslavia was actually created in 1918 by the political people among the South Slavic people. And now remember, they were breaking up the Austria-Hungarian Empire and they were breaking up the Ottoman Empire. And the question was what to do with all these countries now or all of these peoples that no longer had those empires in control of them. Some of the people weren't happy <clears throat> with the creation of Yugoslavia. Some of the common people especially were not happy that they formed this union. <clears throat> There's very little difference ethnically among these Slavic people. The differences are better described as tribal. And I don't think we really understand the significance of tribalism anymore, but we've seen a lot of it in the last 30 years. The South Slavs are closely related, but the tribes are intertwined. They live side by side, yet they fiercely retain their separate identities. It mattered a lot to a croat to be a croat and a Serb to be a Serb, and never the twain should be confused with each other. <clears throat> the Croatians believed that Yugoslavia denied the right of self-determination. And they created a terrorist movement that was fostered by Italy. And Italy at the time was grinding their own ax, fascism. So they were stirring up trouble in Croatia and Macedonia. So the Serbian idea was to be inclusive as long as you were the way they wanted you to be. They saw the speakers of most dialects as Serbs. The Yugoslav ideology that started in the 1840s was inclusive, but it accepted diversity among the tribes, whereas the Serbs did not. Croatia's majority are tribal Croats with a minority group of Serbs. Many different factors separated these groups from each other and religious and cultural more than ethnicity. The Croats are predominantly Roman Catholic and the Serbs are predominantly Orthodox Christians. In no case was Islam among these a significant factor. Islam was a factor in, in the Balkans but not among these particular groups. However, they did have a, a sizable portion of Serb Croatian speaking Muslims in Bosnia. Now, I want to go all the way back <clears throat> before the First World War because this is where it started. There's been turmoil in the Balkans since before the start of the 20th century. The king of Serbia was assassinated and a pro-Russian dynasty came to the throne. And you have to realize this is where the First World War came from because Serbia was associated with Russia before the First World War and, invent and eventually got Russia to, to start war with Austria. Bosnia was part of the Ottoman Empire until 1908, and then it was annexed by the Austria-Hungarian Empire. So these people were all pawns. They were just moved back and forth without a whole lot to say about it. This annexation sparked protests from the powers, Germany, France, and Russia, and from Serbia. So Serbia got into it actually at a fairly significant level. 
In 1909, a Treaty of Berlin was amended and the annexation was become a fait accompli. But this annexation permanently damaged relationships between Austria-Hungary, Italy, Serbia, and Russia. Now, in particular, in Serbia, they saw the Austria-Hungarians as oppressors. The First Balkan War, not the First World War, was fought between the members of the Balkan League, which were Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, and Montenegro, and the Ottoman Empire. The Balkan League was formed under the Russian auspices in 1912, and their intent was to take Macedonia away from Turkey, who was already involved in a war with Italy. The Balkan League had 750,000 troops. In Macedonia, the Serbs achieved victory, the Greeks occupied Thessalonica, in Albania, the Montenegrins and Serbs overwhelmed the Ottomans. So by then you saw the Ottomans as the sick old man of Europe and people were starting to take things away from them. The mistake that they made <clears throat> was thinking that the Ottoman Empire was gonna stay out of the First World War and instead of staying out of it, it joined the Axis. The Turkish collapse was so complete that it, within six months, they signed an armistice. The Balkan League had been victorious. The Ottoman Empire lost all of its remaining European territories, including Macedonia and Albania. Serbia doubled in size because it picked up Kosovo and parts of Macedonia and Albania. But the Balkan Wars made the great powers, back to Germany, France, England, Russia, reassess their foreign policy in the, in the region. They now, in particular Russia, saw Serbia as the buffer against the Austria-Hungarian aggression. Germany at this time really didn't have an oar in this water. <clears throat> the only oar that they had was they had an alliance with Austria. Now I'm going to tell you about somebody whose name you may have heard, Gavrilo Princip. He lived a very short life. He was 24 years old when he died. He was a Bosnian Serb member of something called Young Bosnia, and he sought an end to the Austria-Hungarian rule in Bosnia-Herzegovina. At the age of 19, he assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife, Sophie, in Sarajevo. And you're going to hear about Sarajevo more than once in this talk on 28 June 1914. You know what came next. Princip and his accomplices were arrested. They were implicated in a secret society which had initiated the crisis and led to the outbreak of World War I. So this Serbia all of a sudden stepped onto the world stage in a big way. At his trial, Princip said, I'm a Yugoslav nationalist. I'm aiming for the unification of all the Yugoslavs, but it must be freed from Austria. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison for murdering an archduke and his wife. He got 20 years, but he died <clears throat> four years later from tuberculosis. So he did not live long after this assassination. World War I in the Balkans. I'm sure everybody knows a lot about this. It was between the central powers, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, by the way, which is part of the Balkans, was on the side of the Axis or central powers. And the Allies, and if you see on there, Serbia was on the side of the Allies. 
It began with Austria invading Serbia. Austria wasn't a lot less sick than was the uh, Ottoman Empire, and it did not do well with its invasion. However, they did comp conquer Serbia and Montenegro. The Serbian army retreated to Salonika, which is near Greece, I think. And with the Franco-British Allied Army of the Orients, they fought a trench war against the Bulgarians. So it was down in here, as I understand it. That's where much of the fighting was. They were coming from Hungary, and they came in through here, and they ran into trouble down in here. Greece eventually joined the Allies in 1917. In 1918, the Allies broke through the lines of Bulgaria. Here, Bulgaria surrendered. That liberated Serbia, Albania, and Montenegro from the Central Powers. After the 1918 collapse of Austria-Hungary, the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes was formed. In 1929, it was formally renamed the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Now, the way it was formed was not by people sitting down on a map and drawing lines like they did in the Middle East. It was formed by people from this area, the political leaders of this area, getting the Paris Peace Conference to accord them as a separate country. Now, here's what Yugoslavia was before Tito, i.e. from 1918 until 1945. First thing that happened was in 1929, the king suspended the constitution. He assumed executive power and curbed all separatist tendencies. He was assassinated in 1934. The 30s were marked by intolerance between all of the aggressive, uh, all of the principal figures and by the aggressive attitude of totalitarianism. So they were under a different foot, but they were still underfoot. In 1941, the Germans and Italians invaded Yugoslavia and it took them 10 days to, to capture all of Yugoslavia. More than 300,000 Yugoslavs were taken prisoner. What they did was they established an independent state in Croatia as a Nazi satellite state. It was ruled. So what they did in, in Yugoslavia was the same thing they did in France and the same thing they did in Norway. They set up a puppet government. The militia that they set up was called the Ustasha. And if you've ever heard of the Ustasha, they are among the nastiest group of people you ever want to know anything about. From 41 to 45, the Ustasha murdered over 500,000 people in Yugoslavia, expelled another 250,000 more and forced another 200,000 to convert to Catholicism. Yugoslavia, and I had heard parts of this, during the war they had two factions. One was a group of communist-led partisans and royalists, and then there were a pro-Serbian group led by Mihaljovic, I'm sorry, the pro-Serbian Chetniks were led by Mihaljevic, the other partisans who were, uh, were led by Joseph Broz Tito. In late 1944, King Peter II of Yugoslavia, who was in exile, and I'm not sure where he was exiled, supported Tito as the leader and said that those who did not were traitors. He was recognized by all allied authorities 
<clears throat> as the prime minister of Yugoslavia and the commander in chief of all Yugoslavian forces. So by 1944, Tito was in power. The Germans were still there, but not for long. Who were the Eustachia? They were a group that were set up by the Germans, by the Nazis, to run it. Their strategy was simple. One third of the Serbs to be killed, one third of the Serbs to be expelled, and one third of the Serbs to be converted to Catholicism. It had been up until the war a terrorist organization. They were the ones who assassinated the king in 1934, and they were handed a state, including not only Croatia, but some of Serbia and Bosnia. They then recruited an army and began a campaign of genocide against the Serbs. So here's where the Serbs get their hatred from. They were being murdered by the Eustachia. Resistance groups were formed and much of the population died in that civil war. The most famous Eustachia crime, and I, heard, I read about this in a book a little while ago, was the creation of the concentration camp at Jasenovic. Their specialty, unlike the Germans who liked to, to do what they were doing in mass groups, was one-on-one -on -one violence. In particular, they liked to cut off people's heads. The death toll at Jasenovic and other camps ranged from 700,000 to 1,400,000 victims as much as 10% of the total population. They remained in control until May of 1945, but their effects never went away. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow a Jerry lead here and talk a little bit about the gypsies. They're called the Romani. The Romani reached the Balkans around the 12th century from a migration out of India. So those of you who think that the Romani came from Romania are wrong. They settled in those countries that are listed above, and then from those countries, from the Balkans, they migrated throughout Europe. Large groups of the Roma, and that's the buzzword that they're called most of the time, arrived in Croatia in the 19th century from Romania, Romania after the slavery abolition there. During the era of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, their lifestyle was outlawed, so they could not choose most of the professions that the average person could get into. They could not be doctors, they could not be lawyers, they could not have any professional responsibility. Hey, George? Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask you one thing about the Ustafa. After it was after World War II, uh, the war crimes, were they involved in the war crimes? In you Nuremberg? bet. You bet. And, but I don't know specific, not at Nuremberg. I don't, I think they were, but I don't think there was that, certainly not the major Nuremberg trial. I'm not sure, uh, Norm, how many or who or where. Okay. Thank you. During World War II, the Ustasha almost wiped out the Roma population. In particular, at Jasenovic, 15 to 20,000 of those that I had said earlier were Roma. A considerable number today of Romani refugees in Croatia are from the ethnic conflicts in, in Bosnia. So they're still on the run. There are about <clears throat> 25,000 Roma today in the Balkans, slightly more Catholics than anybody else. This is their, this is their uh, religious preferences as I could find it. Now I wanna talk a little bit about Joseph Broz Tito. 
His name was Joseph Broz. He lived 88 years. He was a communist revolutionary. He had roles in Yugoslavia from 1914 until his death. He was born in Croatia. He was a Slovene Croatian, so he was not a Serb. He was constricted during the First World War into the Austria-Hungarian army. He was captured by the Russians and while as prisoner of the Russians became a communist. During World War II, he was regarded as the most effective resistance mover, movement leader in all of Europe. From 1953 to 1980, he was the president of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Now, it's interesting reading about Tito, you get different pictures. Some criticize him as Author authoritarian, he repressed political opponents, but others see him as a benevolent dictator. His Yugoslavia was a police state. Outside of the Soviet Union, he had more political prisoners than all the rest of Eastern Europe combined. So you did not argue with Tito. He was one of the founders of the Common Forum. The Common Forum is the central organization of the international communist movement that included everybody from East Germany to Hungary to Czechoslovakia to Russia. He was expelled because he fought against the control of the Soviets of policy of the Common Forum. Common Forum. Well, shoot. He was the only leader in Joseph Stalin's time to leave the common form. He began his own socialist program. And the things that I read said that he was tending towards market socialism. And market socialism, I guess, is a good description of what there is in Vietnam right now, which is not complete ownership of everything by the government but an awful lot of government control. George, can I ask a question? Did yeah. the CIA have a hand in that of him breaking away from the Soviet Union? I do not know that. I don't know that they didn't either. It certainly wouldn't surprise me, but I don't know anything about it, Jerry. Yeah, I think they did. They certainly uh, had <clears throat> lots of other things. George. Sir. George, he did break away from Stalin when Russia invaded Hungary and Czechoslovakia. He publicly disapproved of it, and that's when he and Stalin parted ways. But that was 54, right? No, 56? I don't remember when the- well, It wasn't Stalin, but I mean, he and, and the oh, Russian oh, you're right. party. You're right, okay. In fact, I think I remember reading that. That was the, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Ten years after his death, communism collapsed in Eastern Europe. The wall fell, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, and I don't think that, that it's an accident, Yugoslavia descended into civil war. After Tito, 1980, what they did was establish a collective president, presidency of communist leaderships from each of the republics. So they did not break up the country after he died. They, they established this collective leadership structure. Some of the communist government wanted to economize because of foreign debt. By then, Yugoslavia was in terrible debt. And an American-led organization called the Friends of Yugoslavia provided them with a lot of debt relief in the mid 80s, <clears throat> which propped them up. By 1984, they were the host nation of the 1984 Winter Olympics in Sarajevo. And their idea was the continuation of Tito's vision of brotherhood and unity, the multiple nationalities of U Yugoslavia united in one team. 
In fact, in the late 80s, the Yugoslav government began to move away from communism to a market economy, and they started to privatize sections of the economy. However, rising unemployment got the prime minister into trouble and he lost the support that he needed to maintain his position. Yugoslavia broke apart, balkanized, in 1990-1991. Nationalism, ethnic conflict, economic difficulty, frustration with bureaucracy are all blamed, but in particular, Croatia wanted out of the Union. After Tito's death, the most prosperous provinces were Slovenia and Croatia, and they wanted to decentralize. They had wanted to decentralize all during the 80s, and fighting started during the 80s. Not on a, not on a major warfare scale, but they started to have partisan units. They started to have people bitten, shot, and killed. The largest republic, Serbia, which was led by Milosevic, insisted on not breaking up. His rallying call was all Serbs in one state. So he created, he created something called Greater Serbia and annexed parts of Croatia and Bosnia. It would be like Tennessee saying, or like Georgia saying, you know, you got your map drawn wrong. We want the Tennessee River, so we're going to move. We're going to move the border up a few miles. Or Russia, which has gone into Georgia, saying that Georgia, the northern part of Georgia, is actually part of Russia. All of those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. In June of '91, Slovenia and Croatia declared independence. Three months later, Bosnia declared independence. Throughout all this time, there were clashes among partisan units, paramilitary militia, and the organized armies. In Croatia, the Serbian troops decided to fight as a part of Croatia's ethnic Serb rebels who opposed independence. So now Croatia, which is here, as an internal civil war, in addition to being invaded by Serbia. I want to talk a little bit about Milosevic. You might have heard of him. He was the president of Serbia from 89 to 91, and then the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, and that's the country that replaced what was known as Serbia from 91 to 97. He was president of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia from 97 to 2000. He led the Socialist Party of Serbia. He rose to power as the Serbian president, trying to reform the constitution of Yugoslavia in, addition, in response to what people were calling the marginalization of his country or his province, Serbia. He faced many challenges as the country disintegrated, and he usually resorted to force to maintain order. Remember, Serbia was the one with the big organized army. It was the one with the Air Force. That was Serbia. After losing the presidential election, he refused to accept defeat until mass protests forced him to resign. He was then charged with a corruption and abuse of power, there was, a, there was a tribunal form. You were talking before about tribunals. There was a tribunal formed around 2000, Norm, to try these this group of people. And he was one of the first to be tried. He went on trial for charges of genocide and war crimes. He served as his own at attorney. It ended without a verdict when he died from an apparent heart attack in his prison cell. The time he was five years old. He had been taking a leprosy drug for reasons never determined. There was a lot of suicide in his family tree. 
He was then partially exonerated by the court after his death. Somebody have a question? Okay, the Bosnian War. Uh, George, how can you, how, I'm just uh, partially exonerated. I, I mean, either you're exonerated or you're not. I don't understand partially. He was charged with a lot of different crimes, and some of them they found him not guilty of, and some of them they found him guilty of. Okay. George, was this for the attack on Kosovo when he was murdering the Muslims in Kosovo? Uh, that was one of them. That was probably the one that they got the most um, press. Okay. Once Croatia and Slovenia were independent, then they were occupied by the Yugoslavs. The army withdrew from Slovenia very quickly, and I couldn't find out why, except remember Slovenia was out at the edge, the northwestern part of Yugoslavia, and apparently the Slovenians made their uh, occupation out there very ten tenuous. Once Bosnia and, and Herzegovina established independence, then the Bosnian Serbs rebelled and they formed this Republika Skripska. They were led by someone named Radovan Karadze. An army of Serbia invaded Croatia, destroying the towns of Zukovar. Croatian and soldiers and civilians were executed in this particular one. That was one of the things that Milosevic was tried for. They also besieged the town of Dubrovnik. If you ever been to Dubrovnik, <coughs> it's, it's one of the oldest cities on the Dalmatian coast. It's been there the better part of 2,000 years. They besieged it, artillery barrage and whatnot. <coughs> then the Bosnian Serbs began a siege of Sarajevo. So the Bosnian Serbs, the army of Republika Skripska, were fighting the Bosnians. Sarajevo was besieged for almost four years. 10,000 citizens of Sarajevo were killed. There was a fairly large Bosnian army in the city, but they weren't strong enough to break the siege. And they really destroyed Sarajevo. <clears throat> By May of 92, the army of the Republic of Skripska controlled two-thirds of Bosnia. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Radovan Karadze. This is a good story. He's a Bosnian Serb. He was president of the Republican during Skripska during the Bosnian War. He was trained as a psychiatrist. 1984, he was arrested for fraud and spent almost a year in some kind of detention. He co-founded this Republika Skripska and served as its first president from 1992 to 96. He was a fugitive from 96 until July of 2008 because he had also been indicted for war crimes. They concluded there were reasonable grounds for believing he committed war crimes, including genocide <clears throat> against the Bosniak and Croat civilians during the Bosnian War. He was arrested. He stayed out of, out of uh, jail until 2008, and then he was extradited to the Netherlands. And this is where the International Criminal Tribunal was set up. They charged him with 11 counts of war crimes. It's about to get kind of funny. He was called the butcher of Bosnia. He was found guilty of genocide in Srebrenica and crimes against humanity. And he was sentenced to 40 years of imprisonment. So he filed an appeal, which was rejected, and then they increased his sentence to life. So that's where he is now. <laughs> Not a good idea to, to, to appeal. Ethnic cleansing. The Republika of Skripska took over the UN protected safe area of Srebrenica in eastern Bosnia and massacred up. Somebody was asking about the Muslims, massacred up to 8,000 Muslims, the worst mass killing in Europe since the end of the Second World War. 
After the fall of Srebrenica and the bombing of a market in Sarajevo, NATO intervened with airstrikes. So this is when Clinton, I believe, got behind the idea of let's stop this from getting any worse. In November of 1995, following three weeks of peace talks, the leaders of Bosnia, Croatia, Croatia and Serbia agreed to a peace deal. And at that time, they then sent a UN, a NATO peacekeeping force into Bosnia, dividing it into the Muslim Croat Federation and the Republic of Skripska. Fighting resumed in 1998 when Serbian forces invaded Kosovo again. And I don't, I think they did it because the Kosovans wanted to uh, cut themselves off from Serbia. And in fact, that is what happened. George? George? Yeah. Uh, it's very unusual. I mean, all this fighting in the Balkans, and all of a sudden we have we have talks in the city of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, how did that happen? I know Clinton was uh, president at the well, time. Clinton, uh, and there was a man I've been reading about who was in the State Department who set that up. He's, uh, his name, for some reason, all of a sudden escapes me. They saw that this was just nothing but an ongoing bloodbath, that people were not going to find a solution among themselves. The United States sponsored the talks, but this one person, and oh, hell, I wish I could remember his name. Uh, is the guy that brokered the peace. For some reason, Richard something. Between March and June, NATO intervened again. They bombed Yugoslavia back to Serbia to force Milosevic to withdraw from Kosovo. George, this, can I ask a question? Sure. I, I distinctly remember so much death in Srebrenica from the snipers and no one could go out any time, day or night. Is it during this time that that happened? And was uh, Milosevic behind all of that? I don't remember. I don't remember. Ultimately, Milosevic agreed to the, to, uh, the NATO presence in Kosovo and he withdrew. Now, this is what the Balkans look like today. You see how many of them are either members of the EU or want to be members of the EU. How many of them are in NATO or want to be in NATO. They have not, to my knowledge, been fighting uh, in the last two decades. But they are, they are not, this is where Dubrovnik is. I've been to Dubrovnik. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's well worth uh, uh, a visit. I would say that this whole area is at least an uneasy piece. Now, whether or not there is trouble there now, I can't say. I haven't read anything that says that there is but I certainly wouldn't be surprised if there is. Okay, my conclusions. I spent a lot of time working on this and it was really, really difficult for me to make sense out of it. But my, my conclusion is the Balkans have been struggling with each other for a long time. The war and factions still aren't clear to me, but basically my Perception is they were tribal in nature and they followed their nature. They were not interested in the bigger picture. They were interested in their tribes. George, 
Could you uh, also say that it's almost the same similarity with Afghanistan, with all the tribal? I'm, I'm going to get to that. Absolutely. Now, the second conclusion is the old order of empire disappeared in 1918. And the new order was fragile, and it still is. We are still not over the aftershock of the First World War, from my perspective. Perhaps today, the biggest part of the aftershock is in the Middle East, but we're still not over it. These, these empires kept order with a great deal of an iron fist. And when it's gone, chaos is what follows. Much of the animosity in the Balkans is tied to the Nazi control. I mean, the, the Croatians didn't murder a million people and have everybody forget about it. They're also laid to Tito's suppression. And then they're laid to disagreements about how power should be distributed when Tito died. And like I said, they may still be arguing about it. I don't know. In fact, I'd really be surprised if they aren't. I don't think in this country we can appreciate the strength or the hatred of tribal and religious differences. I just don't think that Americans have the perspective of why does being a Croat or being a Serb or being a Slovene or being a Christian or being an Orthodox Christian matters so much, but it matters a great deal to these people. And this is this is just my opinion. The mess in the Middle East is little more than this turmoil moved 500 miles east. Now, my last one is tongue in cheek. I cannot imagine why Churchill saw the Balkans as the soft underbelly of Europe. He saw it both in the First and the Second World War, is that was the way to get to Nazi Germany. That was the way to get to Germany in the First World War. Hence, the Dardanelles campaign. And with that in mind, what kind of questions do you have that I can't answer? Probably a lot. George, just comment on your last your last point there. I think Churchill thought that these, you know, Serbian people would rise up against the Nazis and the Russians, you know, and, and ally with the allies. That's why he considered it a soft, you know, underbelly for the Axis power. Is there any bleed over between the Armenians and the Turks as far as their animosity for each other? In, in, in one respect, the Armenians are a tribe that the Turks see as danger to them. And the best thing to do about a danger is eliminate them. So, so um, eliminate Excuse me, what? And they almost did, George. Right. Eliminating whole groups of people is a way to deal with danger. Uh, we don't condone it. Yeah, but, but that, that was more religious. That was more of a caliphate, you know, uh, between Muslim, Muslims uh, who wanted to eliminate that religion in Eastern Turkey, because Armenia is in Eastern Turkey. You know, not so, even connected with the Balkans. Right. Armenia is a Orthodox, right? Or was. I think. That's right. They were correct. They were Christian. Right. right. But it's the, it, uh, it's the same general principle. If you don't agree with me and I find that you're dangerous, the wisest thing that I can do is take you off the board. It's been going on a long time, and it's still going on right now in the Middle East. Jerry, I got done in an hour. 
Yeah, that's great. And I'm still recording. Okay. You got, you got time to go if you want to continue, George. <laughs> Could you do the first 10 minutes over again, George? I missed it. George, Chris, Chris no. I'll send you the recording. Do a 101. Great George. job, George. That That is a mess. Excellent job. Thank you. Thank George, you, George. You were talking about the Americans don't fully appreciate the tribal thing. When you think about it, all the nationalities are that that encompass America is truly amazing. And all the ethnic differences of all the people in America. And really, when Hitler, Hitler really thought that if, if America got into the war, that Hitler would defeat Americans because they were so um, diverse. And yet, the Americans surprised Hitler. Well, you know, you could actually 